Hi, my name is Tracy Daniels. I am in the High Cape National Medical University. Today we're going to be looking at genetics. We'll talk about some of the major modes of inheritance. We'll look at single gene disorders and we will take a look at cytogenetics. Okay, so let's take a look at some basic definitions. The first is gene. That is the basic unit of inheritance. We have an allele. That is the different variations of a gene in a population. That basically means the different ways in which one particular gene can be expressed in a population. Then we have locus. That is the physical location of a gene. Next term is genotype. That is the different combination of alleles that a person has for a particular gene. Then we have phenotype. Phenotype is the physical expression of the genotype. It basically is what we see based on the genotype that a person has. So the physical characteristics that we see based on a particular genotype. Homozygote meaning that the two alleles for some locus are the same. Heterozygote on the other hand meaning that the two alleles for some locus are different. If a trait is referred to as dominant, it means that a person only needs one copy of that gene or allele for the trait to be expressed. On the other hand, recessive meaning that a person has needs sorry, two copies of the gene or allele for the trait to be expressed. Now, this is, of course, except in X-linked recessive diseases in males because males have only one X chromosome. And so X-linked recessive diseases will be expressed physically in males because of that fact. All right, we're going to take a look at the different types of mutations now. The first type is a missense mutation. Now, in a missense mutation, what happens is that a single base is changed in the gene, and that leads to the codon for one amino acid being changed to the codon for another amino acid. We see this, for example, in sickle cell anemia, where the codon for glutamic acid is changed into the codon for valine, and that is where we see the disorder. Now, nonsense mutation is where the codon for amino acid is chained to a stop codon. So because of this, protein synthesis is stopped prematurely. So what you end up having is an incomplete protein. The next type of mutation we have is a deletion. In a deletion, something is missing from the protein. It could be a single base, it could be an entire codon, but we know that the protein is lacking something. Insertion meaning something is added into the protein. Now we have frame shift and in frame mutation. Now in frame shift mutation, what happens is that a single base is either deleted or inserted. So what happens is that the first half of the protein before the deletion or the insertion is fine. And then we have the other half being totally useless. And obviously this can cause problems if the insertion or deletion happens at the very beginning of protein synthesis. Now in an in frame mutation, what happens is that you have a multiple of three bases being added or deleted. An example, as we see here, is the three base deletion in cystic fibrosis. All right, the next type of mutation we are going to look at is a loss of function mutation. Now, a loss of function mutation is a mutation that leads to something being missing from the cell. An example is if you have a mutation that causes an enzyme deficiency in the cell, that mutation will be termed as a loss of function mutation. The next type of mutation is a gain of function mutation. This is a mutation that creates something new or extra in the cell that was not originally there. An example is a mutation that causes a new enzyme to be produced or a mutation that leads to overproduction of a normal enzyme in a cell. We would term that mutation a gain of function mutation. In this slide, we're going to be looking at pedigree nomenclature. This is going to help you to be able to read and understand pedigrees that you will see in your life as a medical student or as a doctor. All right, so for the first shape, we have a square, a white square. This usually represents a male, a healthy male or a male who is not expressing the trait that you are searching for in the pedigree. A white circle represents a healthy female. When you see a diamond, you know that it represents a fetus or um, someone of unknown sex at the time. A dark or colored in um, square or circle usually represents an affected female or male or a person that has the trait that you are um, trying to find in the pedigree. A square or circle that has a diagonal line running through it usually represents people who are dead. If you see a triangle, it, it represents a miscarriage or death before the 20th week 
of gestation. Now let's pay attention to the last shape. You see a circle that is colored in half black, half white. This usually represents an autosomal recessive carrier. Now I do want us to understand that not every pedigree shows autosomal recessive carriers like this. Usually in other pedigrees you would see an autosomal, an autosomal sorry, recessive carrier as just a normal white square or circle. So just pay attention. All right, the next symbol that we are going to be looking at is a circle and a square that are joined together by a horizontal straight line. This represents two people that are married or together and have children. Now, the next symbol I want us to pay close attention to is a circle and a square that are joined together by two straight lines. This represents consanguinity. Now, consanguinity simply means um, two people that are related and still end up getting married or having children together. They could be siblings, first cousins, second cousins, it doesn't matter. The only important thing is that these two people are related. Now, the next thing I want us to pay attention to is sibship. It is represented by a square or a circle. Circle or square doesn't really matter, but two people. I just want us to pay attention to how the um, outline is drawn. You have two vertical lines linked together by a horizontal line. They are not linked by a straight line like we saw above for the married couple. So just pay attention to these two. Alrighty. The next thing is dizygotic twins and monozygotic twins. They look very similar, but I want you to pay attention to the difference. The dizygotic twins has no horizontal line here. But for monozygotic twins, you clearly see this is the clear-cut difference. So pay attention, look very carefully at your pedigree so you'll be able to differentiate whether they are um, monozygotic or dizygotic twins. Okay, before we start looking at the different modes of inheritance and their pedigrees, I want us to first of all know what to look out for when we are trying to identify the particular mode of inheritance in a pedigree. So when you have um, a dominant trait or um, a dominant mode of inheritance, you would see that that trait appears in every single generation of the pedigree. So if the trait in question or the disease in question appears in every single generation of the pedigree, you know that you are looking at a dominant trait. If it is recessive, you see that it skips some generations, it's present in some, absent in some, you know that you are looking at a recessive trait. Now, a trait is autosomal if there is father-to-son inheritance. If there is no father-to-son inheritance, you are most likely looking at an X-linked trait. We will see some examples um, later on. And mitochondrial um, diseases or mitochondrial traits are only passed through the mother. The father does not pass any mitochondrial disease to their offspring. So these are just a few ways in which you can identify what kind of inheritance you are looking at in your pedigree. The first type of inheritance we are looking at is autosomal dominant inheritance. And like we said earlier, autosomal meaning that there is father to son inheritance and dominant meaning that in the pedigree you see that it appears, the disease appears in every single generation. Let me just get my pen so that we identify these things. So here we have, we see that this father here passes it down to two of his children. They also pass it down to their children. And they also pass it down to their children in the fourth generation. So you see that the trait or the disease is present in every single generation. We have our first generation, second generation, third generation, and our fourth generation, and the disease appears in every single generation. We also know that it is an autosomal disease and not X-linked because there is father-to-son inheritance in the first to second generation. The father does pass it on to his son, and in the second to third generation, the father also passes it down to his son. So we know that this is an autosomal and not an X-linked disease. Now, typical examples of autosomal dominant diseases are familial hypercholesterolemia. We have Huntington disease, neurofibromatosis type 1, Marfan syndrome, and acute intermittent porphyria. These are just examples of autosomal dominant diseases that we have in our world today. 
this slide is just to show you um marfan syndrome that is one of the autosomal dominant diseases that we mentioned in the previous slide and these are just some of the symptoms of marfan syndrome you see that you have the long um fingers you have long legs basically you have very long limbs in marfan syndrome we have long fingers long legs you have disproportionately long arms flat and very long feet they have flexible joints Scoliosis, usually they tend to have scoliosis. They are tall, thin build. They end up having heart and blood vessel complications like aortic dilation, aneurysms, dissections, and mitral valve prolapses. They also have nervous system complications such as dural ectasia. They also have increased risk of pneumothorax. And when you look at their eyes, they tend to have intraocular lens dislocation or ocular hypertension. They may have crowded teeth and a high, long arched neck. These are some of the symptoms of Marfan syndrome. So if you see someone expressing these qualities, you know that the person most definitely or most likely has Marfan syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant disease. So if you take that person, this person's pedigree, for instance, you should see that in every generation in this person's family, they would have at least one person also having Marfan syndrome. All right, the next type of inheritance that we are looking at is autosomal recessive inheritance. Now, we said earlier that recessive meaning means that um, the disease skips um, certain generation. It's not present in every generation. We also said earlier that recessive, if, if a trait or a disease is recessive, it means that you don't need just one gene or allele. You need to inherit both. You need to inherit one from your father, one from your mother to be able to express the um, particular trait or disease in your phenotype. So here we see that in our first to third generations, we actually do not have any people expressing the disease. But here, this is the first pedigree that we have consanguinity. So I'm circling that in red so you can pay attention. So these two individuals, they are cousins. That is because this sister, this brother, they end up having children and their children get married. So they are indeed first cousins. So it is safe to say that the mother and the father or sister and brother were most likely autosomal recessive carriers. They were carriers of the disease or the trait. I did tell you that in some pedigrees they don't really show, but I'm just coloring them in so that you would understand how these were inherited. So you see that probably this mother gave this trait, this recessive trait to her daughter and this father gave this recessive trait to his son. They could have inherited it from either their father or mother in the first generation. It doesn't really matter. But what matters here is that since they are both in the same family, they both have the same recessive trait, and that is why their children end up having the disease. You have two of their children here having the autosomal recessive disease. Now, some examples of autosomal recessive diseases that we have are sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, phenylketonuria, and Tay-Sachs disease. This is an example of an autosomal recessive disease, sickle cell anemia. We are seeing here how a normal red blood cell usually looks like. Just here we see how the normal red blood cell is supposed to look like. And we see what happens in the sickle cell anemia. We see how the shape is affected. Earlier, I told you that sickle cell anemia occurs as a result of a missense mutation. That is because there was a single base change leading to the glutamic acid, amino acid being changed 
into valine and that is when you have sickle cell anemia now some symptoms of sickle cell anemia include um, decreased number of red blood cells and oxygen because the red blood cells major function or main function is the transport of oxygen we have irritability or fussiness in babies severe fatigue or tiredness they have frequent episodes of pain swelling of hands and feet associated with pain. They also have frequent infection, delayed growth noted in children and adults, and many tend to have vision problems as well. The next type of inheritance we will be looking at is X-linked recessive inheritance. Now I want us to take note that in X-linked recessive inheritance, males tend to be directly affected and females tend to be carriers. This is because, like I said earlier on, males have only one X chromosome. And so that chromosome that they um, inherit will cause them to express whatever disease or traits they inherited physically. And also, as I mentioned earlier, in X-linked in diseases or X-linked inheritance, there is no father-to-son inheritance. This is because the fathers give their sons the Y chromosome and they receive the X from their mothers. So here, let us see. For example, in our first generation, let me get my pen. This is our first generation. This is our second generation third generation and our fourth generation now in the first generation in the first generation you see that there is no father to son inheritance because it is an x linked recessive disease if the father was if the father was affected you would see that his square would be painted black but it is white so you know that the trait did not come from the father also the sons inherited their Y chromosome from their father and X chromosome from their mother. So we know that or it is safe to say that their mother was or is a carrier of the X linked recessive trait and she passed it on to two of her sons. Now let us look at the second to third generation. Here we see that we have an affected father here but he doesn't pass it on to any of his sons. All his sons are healthy because they are receiving the Y chromosome and not the deceased X chromosome. But when you look at the third generation, at this daughter here, she most likely inherited the deceased X chromosome from her father. And so she was a carrier of the trait and that is why her son here is affected because he inherited the diseased X chromosome from his mother. Now, examples of X-linked recessive inheritance um, diseases are Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we have G6PD deficiency, hemophilia A and B, and red-green color blindness. This is just um, to show you the various symptoms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Let's look at the second image in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we have decreased heart function and cardiomyopathy, which can lead to heart failure. They also have weak diaphragm, which tends to lead to respiratory failure. This can be a cause of death in many of the affected children. They also have loss of muscle mass, inflammation and fibrosis. Most, if not all of the people that have Duchenne muscular dystrophy cannot walk after some time and they all require wheelchair or assistance to move. In our first image here, we have um, other symptoms. You're seeing here that shoulders and arms are held back awkwardly when they walk. They tend to sway back when moving. They have weak butt muscles. Their knees may bend back to take the weight because they're not able to actually support the full weight of the body their belly stick out due to the weak belly muscles the child has thin weak thighs especially the frontal part poor balance awkwardly clumsy when walking they have weak muscles in the front of their leg that causes their foot to drop and have tiptoe contractures they have a tight heel cord and so the child may walk on their toes they have thick lower leg muscles and this muscle is mostly fat and not strong so like i said earlier they will have trouble walking 
type of inheritance we will be looking at is X-linked dominant inheritance. We know that this is a dominant um, type of inheritance because we see deceased individuals in every single generation. Here, first generation. Second generation, we have deceased individuals. And in our third generation as well, we see deceased individuals. This is our third generation. And we see here that there are no carriers. Every single person that inherits the gene actually manifests the disease. Here we see that the mother gave the deceased um, gene to one son and one daughter, and they both manifested. We know that this is dominant because the mother the daughter that inherited from the mother actually ended up manifesting or showing symptoms of the disease and we know that it is extinct because there is no father to son inheritance we see that the males here or oh, there is no father to son inheritance because the males will inherit the y chromosome from their father which is healthy now in X-linked um, dominant diseases. Some examples are fragile X syndrome. In fragile X syndrome, males have 100% penetrance. Some symptoms include mental retardation, large ears, prominent jaw, and macroorchidism that is abnormally large testes. Females have 60% penetrance, and um, some symptoms are mental retardation. This is an example of a child that has, a male child that has fragile X syndrome. Like I said before, some of the symptoms include prominent or long ears, like we see here, a long face, delayed speech, large testis, hyperactivity, tactile defensiveness, gross motor delays, and autistic-like behaviors. The next type of inheritance we will be looking at is mitochondrial inheritance. I do want us to take note of the fact that there is only maternal inheritance here. That is, we only inherit our mitochondrial DNA from our mother's side. So if you take a look at our first and second generations, you can see that the mother passed down the disorder to all three of her children. Now, if you look at our second and our third generation, you can see that for the first child here, because it was a boy who inherited the disease, he did not pass it down to any of his children. But for the other two children in the second generation, you can see that they passed it down to all of their children because they inherited it from their mother's side. So mitochondrial inheritance is purely from the mother's side. Now some examples of uh, mitochondrial diseases are Leber hereditary optic neuropathy. We have MELAS that stands for mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes and myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red muscle fibers. This is just some symptoms of leber hereditary optic neuropathy. This was an example of mitochondrial um, diseases. It usually um, presents typically in males in the third decade of their life, occasionally in females at any age. It usually starts initially with unilateral visual loss and the fellow eye follows within a couple of months. There is also bilateral optic atrophy. Next, we are going to be looking at complications that affect the inheritance of single gene disorders. The first complication is variable expression. Now, what happens here is that for a particular genetic disease, not every person that has this disease will have the same severity of symptoms. Some will be severely affected, others will be mildly affected. Some examples are hereditary hemochromatosis and neurofibromatosis type 1. Our second complication is incomplete penetrance. Now, what happens is that some individuals who have a particular disease genotype do not display the disease in their phenotype. So yes, they do have the gene, but it's not everybody that expresses it physically. Examples are retinoblastoma and inherited breast cancer. Our third complication is pleiotropy. Now, 
what this basically means is that in pleiotropy you have um, some single disease causing mutation that affects multiple organ systems. So it doesn't just target one system, but you would have one disease being expressed in many organ systems in the body. An example is Marfan syndrome, and we did see some symptoms of Marfan syndrome earlier, and you see that it affects many, many systems of the body. Our next complication is locus heterogeneity. What happens here is that you have the same disease phenotype that can be caused by mutations at different loci or different physical locations. An example is osteogenesis imperfecta or brittle bone disease that is caused by mutations in collagen genes at either chromosome 7 or chromosome 17. Our next complication is delayed age of onset. What happens here is that individuals with the disease mutation do not manifest the symptoms or the phenotype until much later in life. An example is Huntington disease, and we did see earlier on that Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disease. Our next complication is anticipation. What happens here is that the most recent generation develop the disease at a much earlier age or with greater severity. Examples are myotonic dystrophy and fragile X syndrome. Okay, so now we are entering the world of cytogenetics. This is basically the study of microscopically observable alterations in chromosomes. I do want us to take note of the fact that we study cells in the metaphase stage because that is when they are highly condensed and most easily visible. Now, normal humans do have 23 pairs of chromosomes. That gives us a total of 46 chromosomes. This is divided into 22 pairs of autosomes and our 23rd pair being our sex chromosomes, that is our X or our Y. Also, we should take note of the fact that autosomes are numbered in order of decreasing size. The centromere is what separates the shorter P arm from the longer Q arm. If you ever get confused as to which arm is long or short, when you think of P arm, think of the French word petite, because that is what they use to actually name the short P arm of the chromosome. We have different types of um, chromosomes based on the location of their centromere. Metacentric chromosome, meaning that the centromere is approximately in the center. Submetacentric, meaning that the centromere is away from the center and displaced towards one end. And acrocentric chromosome, meaning that the centromere is very close to the end of the chromosome. So this is just an example of human chromosome structure. We see that the autosomes are numbered in order of decreasing size, one being the largest and chromosome number 22 being the smallest. We see our X and Y chromosomes or our sex chromosomes as well. Next, we will be taking a look at some numerical chromosomal abnormalities. When you see the word euploidy, it refers to a cell that has a multiple of 23 chromosomes. So underneath that we have haploid. Haploid meaning that there is one member of each pair that is gametes. So we have in gametes we have a total of 23 chromosomes. Diploid you have two copies of each pair. We see that in our somatic cells and we have a total of 46 chromosomes. Now triploid and tetraploid are abnormal. In triploid we have three copies of each pair giving us a total of 69 Cells. It happens in 1 in 10,000 births. These um, children do not survive and it usually happens when the egg is fertilized by two sperm. In tetraploid, we have four copies of each chromosome giving us a total of 92 chromosomes. It's very rare lethal and it usually occurs when an egg is fertilized by three sperm. All right, in aneuploidy, what happens is we have a deviation from the normal number of chromosomes due to a loss or a gain of a specific chromosome. It usually happens as a result of non-disjunction in meiosis. Do take note that all autosomal monosomies are lethal. So when you hear the word monosomy, it means that there has been a loss of a particular chromosome. If you hear the word trisomy, it means there has been a gain of a particular chromosome. Chromosome. We have some trisomies that are compatible with life, and they are trisomy 21, that is Down syndrome, trisomy 18, Edwards syndrome, trisomy 13, that is Patel syndrome. These are all autosomal trisomies. Now, we do have an example of a sex chromosome trisomy, that is Klinefelter syndrome, that happens only in males, where the male has an extra X chromosome. And an example of a sex 
monosomy is Turner syndrome. It happens only in females when the female loses one X chromosome. This slide just shows us some of the symptoms of the diseases we spoke about in the previous slide. Trisomy 21 Down syndrome on the left part of the slide and trisomy 18, that is Edwards syndrome, on the right part of the slide. These are just some of the common physical signs that you would see. We also have here trisomy 13 on our left, that is Patel syndrome, and some symptoms of Klinefelter syndrome on our right. Remember that we said Klinefelter syndrome only occurs in males. All right, now we will be taking a look at structural chromosomal abnormalities. The first example is a translocation. Now, translocation, we do have different types. First, we have a reciprocal translocation. What happens here is that two different non-homologous chromosomes exchange pieces with each other. Some clinical examples of this occurs with a reciprocal translocation of chromosome number 9 and chromosome number 22. This gives the Philadelphia chromosome. Now, this usually alters the ABO oncogene and leads to chronic myelogenous leukemia. That is just one example of a reciprocal translocation. Next, we have what we call a Robertsonian translocation. It usually happens only between two acrocentric chromosomes. What happens here is that you have two different non-homologous chromosomes getting stuck together. I do want you to take note that 5% of Down syndrome patients are as a result of Robertsonian translocations. Our next type of structural chromosomal abnormality is a deletion. We have different types of deletions. The first type is an interstitial deletion. What happens here is that something from the middle of the chromosome is missing or taken out. An example is Prader-Willi and Angelman syndromes that occur in chromosome 15. Next, we have terminal deletion. What happens is the end of the chromosome is missing or taken away. An example is Crudishat syndrome that occurs in chromosome 5. This slide just helps you to have a visual presentation of what we spoke about in the previous slides. On the left, we have a reciprocal translocation and on the right, we have a Robertsonian translocation chromosomal abnormalities we should take note of are inversions. What happens in an inversion is that you have part of a chromosome cut out, turned upside down, and stuck back in again. This usually doesn't cause any symptoms unless it leads to a deletion. We do have two types of inversions. We have pericentric inversion. That happens if the part of the chromosome that was inverted included the centromere. And we have paracentric inversion if the part of the chromosome that was inverted did not include the centromere. Our next type of chromosomal abnormality is ring chromosome. This happens when the two ends of a chromosome come together to form a circle. It usually does not cause any significant problems unless it leads to some part of the chromosome being lost from the cell. Next, we have an isochromosome. This happens where you have two P arms or two Q arms of a particular chromosome getting stuck together. All right, this brings us to the end of my presentation. I do hope you enjoyed your time with me and I do hope you learned something. Thank you so much for sticking with me through till the very end. Goodbye.